Patty Wolf is our next reader. Patty Wolf earned her MA in writing from Johns Hopkins University in 2004. She counts as her credentials a week with captive wolves in Battleground, Indiana, a summer hand raising engineering endangered, excuse me, crane chicks near Bowie, Maryland, hand feeding an endangered baby condor, animal acupressure for an, a possum <laughs> named Alice for highly sensitive equine clients for dogs and cats, in addition to 40 years of journal writing and 20 years working in journalism and technical writing in Washington, D.C. and New York City, Hattie is certified in reflexology and practiced in acu a animal acupuncture and therapeutic sound. She teaches a self-designed class called Heal Your Mother Wound, a listening, writing, and beating circle for tapping into your creative healing voice. You can find some of Hattie's more recent writing at the blog Animal excuse me, animalwordswordpress.com and you can contact Hattie at wolfwmn at gmail.com. Thank you very much, Hattie Wolf. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to move this aside. I have a loud voice. Can everyone hear me all the way in the back? Ron, can you hear me? Great. Okay. So, Today I'm going to read from an essay that is titled, Of Wolves, My Mother and Me. Stretched out on my library table in my writing studio here in Baltimore, Maryland, is a full-length wolf pelt. It has an amazing presence. No longer a living creature, but a wolf nonetheless. Though empty, the wolf pelt presence fills me, an unexpected reminder of what was missing in my relationship with my mother. In her presence I felt profound emptiness. Before my mother left our family, before she inexplicably ran off, just being with her made me feel an aching loneliness. From the start, my German shepherd nurtured me, taught me the fine art of sensing presence, of finding support and strength in apparent emptiness. What did my mother withhold from me to leave me feeling so empty? After she disappeared when I was just 14, what did I leave behind? How did I find my own way to a life that I've made so full? I couldn't have done it without the wolves. For years, I've started and stopped writing this story. In the past, I went looking for answers to what happened to me and why. Today, I'm looking to take back the missing parts of me left behind in an early life filled with grief, fear, and rage. I have more work to do with my mother. Though dead now, the mark of her ways can still intimidate. I need to return to the forest, to go back to the place where our lives intersected, to where I left things behind. Some part of me calls me back there. I no longer travel alone. It is 1959. I am a toddler. Awake, I lie in bed listening. Silence. I roll over to the edge, drop down onto the floor, pad into the kitchen. The chairs, all in a huddle around the kitchen table, don't tell me where everyone has gone. No cups, black coffee steaming, wait for my mom's, my aunt's, my uncle's return. My eyes dart around the kitchen floor and down the hall. Where's my mom? My dog is never far, his German shepherd body always ready for me to lean into. 
everybody's gone. I start to cry. The front door opens and Edith steps inside. I want my mom, I cry, running into her arms. Be a good girl and she'll be back soon, Edith tells me. And that's what I became, a good girl. Adept at hiding the rest of me from a mother bent on control, from the mother I grew to abhor. Yet, from that moment in 1959, I internalized every criticism and blamed myself when she finally disappeared. Twelve years passed. In March 1972, my family gathered to celebrate my brother Rich's 16th birthday. If you ever need anything, and I'm not here, my mother said that night in a private moment, go see Reverend Martin. I nodded, shrugged, turned back to my brother's party. The next evening, after he played basketball, Rich picked me up from babysitting. While we walked home through Pittsburgh streets, lights on in every house we passed, I asked about his game. At 14, I memorized the names of motorcycle parts to give me conversation openers with my brother's friends. The sight of our dark house silenced me. Mother always lit the front porch and hallway lights after dark. I raced up onto the porch, fumbled for my key, my brother right behind me. Inside, Rich took the steps three at a time to the second floor. I ran through the empty first floor rooms. Back again at the front door, I shouted, I'm going to the parsonage. Rich followed after searching the rest of the house. Later, Jim Martin dropped us back at our house. Wait here, he said. I'm going to get your Aunt Edith. Lights now blazed from every window. Rich headed upstairs. I went back for the, through the first floor more slowly. My fingers traced the cold copper bottom of the stainless steel pot on the stove, the red laminated tray that held our toaster sat askew, a white triangle of paper beneath it. Moments later, leaning against my brother, I read my mother's round ink scrawl dashed across the fine blue lines of the index card. I've gone to find us a new home, her note cryptically said. Then in words only for Rich, take care of your sisters. I sobbed into his shoulder. The next morning, I woke to find a wet red stain on my underpants. I'd reached sexual maturity overnight. A frightened whimper stuck in my throat. I awoke in uncharted territory. Outraged at my mother's departure, terrified at having been left behind, I felt unable to cope. I went to stay with the Martins. My mother arrived back in town just a few weeks later. She roamed in and out of Pittsburgh at least twice more that summer of 1972. Four months later, I rode out of town with the Martin family. Jim pointed the car northeast toward Algonquin Provincial Park in Canada for a month of camping. Before I came back with the Martins, I knew my mother planned to be gone for good. I shed no tears that day we left town, not one howl out of me. It turns out wolves howl for a multitude of reasons, all of which communicate an audible, this is who I am, statement to other wolves who recognize each unique wolf voice. Even poor imitation howls can draw wolves out of hiding to satisfy their curiosity. Poor imitations trigger wolves to howl. Howling wolves trigger a range of human emotions and feelings can trigger a wolf for a multitude of reasons to howl with real emotion. I still had my own emotions deeply buried by the time we arrived in Algonquin Provincial Park in August 1972. The sun waning one late afternoon, I found myself with Jim and Millie and their family 
hiking through a Canadian forest. To ground myself in the likely details of that Canadian hike, I think of the repeated hikes I've taken through the woods of Maine since that time. Fragrant pine and balsam must have filled the air that night, a cushion of decaying evergreen needles softening our steps. I don't recall those small sounds the forest must have whispered to us that evening. I imagine the light, low as it is in late August, particularly in the Northeast, and low as it was that time of day. It must have cut through the forest in golden beams, splintered apart by the dense stands of trees, a flashing golden brilliance before us, dark shadows behind. We reached the trail's end at a wide ravine in time to watch the sunset. A trail marker said we might hear nearby wolves. Jim cupped his hands around his mouth and howled. I held my breath. All of my short life I had lived in two Midwest cities with no more dirt beneath my feet than a patch of yard beside the house or the park we got to by city bus. I gave little thought to my home territory, though I roamed the streets and alleys an isolated, lonely child. The first wolf's howl rose and fell in pitch before a second wolf joined it. Those with better ears than mine, and more trained in the study of wolves, say it can be impossible to, to determine the number of wolves howling in a forest. One can sound like two, two can seem to multiply. Jim howled again. Eerie, mournful voices responded from both sides of the ravine, it seemed. Then, from all around us, wolf voices encircled our five-person pack. We listened quietly as we stood together in the cooling night. In the end, Algonquin Park stretched me, startled me out of my mournful reverie but nothing prepared me for the voices of the wolves. That night, I curled up in a sleeping bag inside a tent. Jim filled my daylight hours with lessons on how to choose the best kindling and how to start a fire, how to hop into a canoe without landing in the water, how to paddle. With Jim in the stern, we paddled back and forth, forth across Little Tea Lake. I speak now from the distance decades create, no notes scribbled to myself, written excitedly the, that evening inside my tent. Did something in me say this is important? Probably not. Just one of those crystal clear memories trapped in my head like a rabbit trapped in the jaws of a wolf. More likely, the emotion in those howls snared my wounded self unexpectedly. Sound waves passed through solid objects, including frozen feelings. Withheld emotion vibrates sympathetically with emotion. Those howling voices must have startled a whale I buried inside me, spooked into hiding when my mother walked out. Even though I didn't let it out, a new emotion rose up beside it. There, next to my new family, listening to the wolves, I felt safe for the first time in my life. During those days and for many years afterward, I kept a hard, angry lid on my emotions. The Algonquin wolves slipped into the forest of my memory, elusive and invisible. I started my second year of college hungry to write. More than a decade would pass before the wolves stepped back out of the forest and into my arms. In February 1985, at the urging of my dog trainer, I left home in New York City to spend a week observing captive wolves at Wolf Park in Battleground, Indiana. With a mix of high anxiety and blind enthusiasm, I found myself early in the week helping an older volunteer collect two frozen dead calves from a nearby farm to feed the captive wolves. Later that same afternoon, I sat alone in the observation hut. My boots kicked aside, my feet against the, the warm space heater. Outside, the wolves slept. 
As the afternoon waned, the pack became active. Individuals howled from time to time. One duet, then a chorus from the pack. While I watched, the wolves began to wander from one end of the large enclosure, enclosure to the other, sniffing at noses at the raised tails of females still in heat. One wolf passed another of a higher rank. Suddenly, the alpha wolf straddled the other and with jaws wide open, pinned his neck to the ground. A moment later, the two broke apart, the tension released. I had turned my attention to one wolf off in the corner of the pen, pacing, when a commotion across the enclosure caught my attention. One of the lower ranking males was mounting a female. Their union could result in a physical tying together, I'd learned already, that can last for up to 30 minutes. Animal behavior and social dynamics combined to captivate me on that long ago day. Give me a seven by seven foot room with windows on all four sides, a warm heater to keep back the February chill, silence, and a pack of wolves to watch, and I'm in seventh heaven, I wrote in my notebook that afternoon. I didn't recognize it then, but I was tapping into a basic truth for me. In the presence of animals, in the presence of wolves, I felt whole. The essence of who I was, who I still am, was buttressed by a web of animal lives connected to my own. This connection ran deep, a vein of gold embedded in an iron core I could trace all the way back to my birth. This wolf here, beside me, as I write, appears to be just a pelt. Yet, since wolf arrived, I feel a new presence in the room, as if at any moment this animal might lift its back end into the air, stretch out this front paw I hold, leap down off the table to the floor, and speak to me. Writing about my mother's departure with Wolf at my side has made me think about integrity, about owning a truth about myself. Wolves travel through their world at once independent and connected, unashamed and unapologetic about how they live their lives. Who wolves are excites me. I feel it in my heart, in the beating of my pulses. Who my mother was both terrified me and outraged me. I knew her furies, her stony silences. My sister called her crazy. Jim Martin warned me my mother could be dangerous compelled to understand her, I first blamed myself for her departure, then convinced myself I could refuse to be like her if only I could sniff out her motives. The more I searched for them, the more I grew submissive and fearful. I now realize I've used anger like my mother did as a weapon to keep the world out while well, I've raged against myself to keep from having to step out into the world. It took Wolf visiting me here in my writing studio for me to realize the stories I have always told myself about my childhood have been a strong steel trap. They've kept me caught in the past. It took Wolf's visit for me to understand that 40 years ago, when my mother walked out, it was the wolves who called me home. I recall now that afternoon I carried the wolf pelt, wrapped in a red wool bundle, into my Baltimore condo. I unfolded layer upon layer of red blanket until I reached the center where wolf uncurled out into my arms. Thank you. <laughs>